Hello, everybody. Kirk Spano with the Retirement Income Options presentation for Monday, August 8th, 2022. Stock markets rallying just a little bit today, uh, but coming off uh, as we speak. So we'll see how things go. I did put out a Global Trends ETF report over the weekend with a using the Global Trends ETF uh, uh, piece as well to make it real easy. So make sure you see those. I talk about the macro environment a bit. I am sticking with, I think that we retest the bottoms uh, of the stock market sometime in all September, October, and then maybe even again at, at the end of the year after the election. I think you're going to get several chances to invest here between now and the end of the year. Uh, Tom Lee over at FS Insights calls it a buy the dips regime. Most of his analysts see the stock market going to somewhere between 360 and 330 on SPY. Uh, I take the low end of that. I think 320s is where I keep landing, but you know 330 is pretty close. So I think you can be okay with that. Why do I think that? I think that the Fed is probably going to be aggressive yet in uh, August and September and maybe even October. We'll see. I don't see the economy slowing down much. We still have nominal GDP growth over 8% and inflation is in fact coming down. So we'll probably get a positive print for Q3. Uh, not much, maybe 1%, 1.5%, somewhere in there. If you take a look at the Atlanta GDP numbers, that's kind of what they're saying. Uh, that is uh, very subject to time lag, so like everything else. So will we see... Uh, positive real GDP, in inflation adjusted GDP for Q3? I think so. But if inflation uh, stays high and my trip to the grocery store says at least the food is still expensive, uh, then you know maybe we do get a third quarter of very slightly negative real GDP. Uh, but keep in mind, that's not because the economy is slowing down very much. We still have nominal growth uh, up around 8%. And even if that drops down to say six or seven, that's still a pretty big number. Uh, I was talking to somebody who is a newly minted master of economics at 50 something years old. And, uh, you know, he's, he's tied to the academics. He's a smart guy. Uh, what I don't think he's understanding is that the data from the last 20 years uh, doesn't play out historically to all the things you study when you're getting a degree that go back all the way to World War II and even beforehand. If inflation is normally under 2%, which is basically what we've had for 20 years, uh, then it means that deflation is a real thing, that it's probably going to come back. And if we could have nominal growth of around 5% and inflation under 2 that means we're going to get GDP handles, real GDP handles uh, in the threes and around four, which would be spectacular. Uh, I actually think that's what's going to happen. I think by 26, 27, right in there, uh, we're going to see GDP numbers from the build out of decarbonization technologies and the fourth industrial revolution. I think we're going to see nominal GDP in the fives and sixes for a pretty long time because of the millennial spending on top of that. And I think that because of the aging of the boomers and because of technology and all the other things that we talk about that are deflationary in the long run, I, I man, I just, I see real GDP numbers in the threes and fours for a long time, at least on and off for 10, 15 years. And that means that after this little earnings recession, we're probably going to see quite the boom after companies adjust to the new corporate minimum income tax, which is being passed as we speak. So what am I doing right now? Well, for selling puts and covered calls, I've done the screening. There's really nothing overbought in our universe uh, that I would want to sell covered calls on yet. Now, are there things out there that are overbought? Sure. You still have some of the energy stocks that are a little overbought, but they've come back quite a bit, just like I said they would a month or two ago. Uh, I'm having a hard time finding anything that's dramatically overbought from the standpoint of I would sell a covered call. Now, there are plenty of stocks that are overvalued, right? Overbought is technical analysis. Overvalued is fundamental analysis. There are plenty of zombie stocks in the S&P 500 that are overvalued. And KKR was talking about how they're cherry picking the high yield debt right now. 
what you can do if you want to find stocks that are overvalued with the idea that you sell them if you own them, but short them if they happen to get overbought as well as overvalued, just take a look at the junk bond. So take a look at where companies in the S&P 500 have bonds that aren't really trading close to par. Those are the companies that you better watch out for. Those are your zombies. So when they're trading at 90 and 80 and 70 cents on the dollar, rest assured that they're probably going to go to 50, 40 and 30 cents on the dollar the next time there's an economic hiccup or the market just realizes, hey, these guys aren't executing. And in a higher interest rate environment, they've got problems. And that's what's coming. Uh, I talked about this way back in 2020, that it was going to happen around 2025, six and seven, because that's when the Federal Reserve support, uh, the bailout that they essentially did by buying corporate bonds, that's when all that support goes away. And I don't think you're going to see the Federal Reserve bail out bad companies. You know, maybe there's going to be a handful of bailouts if, you know, like a GM would go bad or something, giant employers, but companies that don't employ huge numbers of people. And I'm, I'm talking, you know, your top 50 or 60 or 70 employers, they're just not going to be able to get government largesse in the future because we're going to be taking care of Medicare. So you are probably seeing your last or second or third to last chance to dump the zombies. And this apocalypse for the zombie companies, those 100 to 200 companies in the S&P 500 that don't have growth and they have bad debts and they're capital intensive, you know, I don't know how many more times I can talk about that. It, it's coming and it's coming hard. And if you take a look at what's going up, it's all those SMID caps that I told you were going to go up. I mean, they're, I'm looking at my screen right now. You know, Ametis is up another 9%. Uh, Black Sky is up 9%. Uh, DNA is up 3%. Uh, Ford is up over 2% and not, not exactly a mid-cap. Um, Heron Therapeutics going up into earnings. We'll see how that goes. Uh, I still love that company long-term. So if we go through all of these, um, you know, this is a really good list we have. Palantir is one of the stocks I'm recommending today. And we'll talk about that in a second. Somebody asked, could I do a do I, could I print up the zombie list someday? No, probably not. No, I'll pick them out here and there. Uh, but if you own S&P 500 companies, it's on you to go and look at their growth rates and their free cash flow and the amount of financing that they're doing and how much debt they have. And I'm giving you the formula. If you own S&P 500 companies, I'm telling you, take the time to go and look at their growth rate. If their growth rate is under 5%, sell them. Done. Get rid of them. If they are dependent on interest financing, if they're dependent on CapEx cycles and they don't have growth, sell them. Most of the REITs you can sell. If you drive around the country right now, what are you seeing being completed all over the country this summer? Apartments and condo buildings. Not a lot of single family homes because we don't have the people to build them all, but multifamily is going up at a near record pace, the fastest in 15 years. We've got like seven buildings in, in Milwaukee area that are opening soon. A couple of them are huge. Chicago, same thing. Las Vegas, same thing. Phoenix, same thing. So a lot of the REITs that you think are great deals, take a look at those 20-year charts and realize that they're just cyclical trades. They are not buy and hold forever because, oh, look, I get my dividend. You might not. Remember, a lot of them cut their dividend in 2020. And as the buildings get older, and rents stabilize or come down because there is more inventory and boomers are dying and there's not a lot of babies being born. There's a lot of things that people are in that they shouldn't be in. So between the S&P 500 zombies and a lot of REITs that are going through transitions and need maintenance and that maintenance has got to be financed, there's just, there's just not a lot of good REITs out there right now either. Uh, the industrial REITs are the ones to be in. But almost anything else, uh, unless you are investing at the ground level like I'm trying to do, they're just not great deals. The haircut involved with a lot of REITs is substantial. I know that because I'm trying to start a REIT so I can take my 15 or 20% out of it. And that's really what those are out there. You know, REITs are not cheap for you. If you really look underneath the hood of most REITs, they are pulling out a lot of money. So unless you're an, an accredited investor and getting into some limited partnerships, which I'll be offering soon, where you can actually get a 10 to 15% per year return, plus some growth, you, you ought to be staying away from most REITs right now. They're, they're just not going to get a whole lot better uh, before they get worse. Now, 
at the very bottom of the of the trough, like in April of 2020, sure, you buy them, you know, but understand that that's a cyclical trade and you should be selling them now. I should have been selling them four, five, six months ago when I published a couple articles saying to sell some of these REITs. In any case, uh, junk bonds, yeah, you can look those up on FINRA. Um, what do I want to sell puts on today? Palantir, Intel, Warner Brothers Discovery, and DAP. So I don't have anything up on Palantir and Intel yet, but I will. But here's the Warner Brothers Discovery. So I spent I spent the weekend going through uh, Deadline.com and, and a bunch of other industry um, magazines, reading about Zaslav and his plans for Warner Brothers Discovery. Here's what I think. All the things that I was talking about a year ago and six months ago are happening. Warner Brothers has taken the knife to all sorts of redundant things and all sorts of things that don't make them much money. And they're pivoting. So while AT&T wanted to take everything straight to streaming so they could win subscribers, Discovery isn't doing it the same way. Discovery is saying, look, we have great studios. We're going to take the movies to the theater first and make that money. And then we'll put them on streaming. Or if people want to watch them on their TV while they're in the theater, they can pay nine bucks for it or 10 bucks for it. Just like they're going to the theater. The age of free, now that we're getting to the mature phase, right? The rush for eyeballs is just about over. Now we're getting to the mature phase. These companies are going to increase their cash flows. The same way that the frackers are getting to do right now, right? The fracking industry, the oil industry, not profitable for the better part of 15 years, and then suddenly gushing cash flow. Why? Consolidation, elimination of competitors, tighter supply. Now, of course, the oil picture is going to get destroyed pretty quickly because we're going to have decreasing oil demand soon. So that's a blip, that's a trade. But the cash flows are going to be generated from the surviving streamers and then the broadband companies. It's just going to keep drifting up. Meanwhile, their expenses are going to keep drifting down. That's what's going on on Warner Brothers Discovery. Now, because of the merger that they are uh, that they just finished up, they had a tax uh, deadline so that they could cut a whole bunch of things and it was favored, favorable to them on their reporting and their taxes. So for example, they canceled Batgirl. They're not going to take it straight to streaming, which is what AT&T wanted. They put Batgirl in the vault. They're going to reshoot some scenes. They're going to reset it up for a theatrical release at the end of next year. Why are they doing that? It has something to do with uh, the timeline in the metaverse, the, 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 the multiverse of their stories. So different movies are supposed to come up out at different times and Batgirl was coming out before something else in the timeline uh, before it was supposed to. So they're going to push Batgirl behind uh, a different movie and they're going to take it to the theater because that's what Discovery wants to do. Because why would you make a $100 million movie and then release it for free on streaming? They're going to get their money back at the theater and then put it on streaming. And that's going to be the model that Warner Brothers Discovery uses. So I think Zaslav is right to do that. Several months ago, I put something on Twitter with a chart that showed that HBO Max and Discovery Plus could be merged. They just announced they're going to do what I suggested. So for now on, um, and it, it's going to use the Discovery technology, which is good because the HBO technology wasn't the best, jammed up a lot. Discovery technology is awesome, really easy to use. So if you have Discovery, you'll be able to add HBO Max. If you have HBO Max, you'll be able to add Discovery. That's what it sounds like anyway. I don't know what they're going to call it, but I suggested to them HBO Max Discovery. Well, kind of neat, right? That's kind of neat. I have HBO Max Discovery. I get HBO and Discovery. It's the Max. I don't know. We'll see how they do it. But the cash flows are going to improve by about 3 to $4 billion next year. It's a huge jump. And they have a CEO of the entertainment division who is apparently very loved in Hollywood. He's some sort of superstar. They're calling him a unicorn. And he just does a great job. So they're going to monetize the things that they can monetize. They're going to cut the expenses that they can cut. And they're going to get a lot of synergies out of this merger, just as I described. To the tune of 3 to $4 billion by next year. It might even be $5 billion, but $3 billion on the low end. $4 billion is probable. $5 billion is maybe. Their target for subscribers globally by 2025, I think, is way low. I think they're understating it by 50 million people, maybe. When you consider that Netflix has 220 million people globally, I don't think it's unlikely that HBO Max Discovery is going to get to that number. They have a, they have a content library. They have two great studios, and they have the best reality TV out there. 
Oh, and by the way, they own CNN, which gives them the news that they need. And they have baseball, basketball, and football through TNT and TBS. So they have everything that a network television would need. So however they decide to distribute it, they can maximize it through the cable packages, through a free ad-supported service, which they're launching, and the subscription streaming services, which give you on-demand and exclusive series and the movie library kind of like right after the theater releases so what am i doing i already own a big slug of warner brothers discovery because i got in on the merger uh which i you know i could have waited on apparently in hindsight uh things get you know easier to understand but i am selling both of these puts depending on the account i'm selling the december 1250 puts for a buck which i don't think are going to get put to me or my clients take them if they do have no problem with that. That's just, it's already dirt cheap. This would be dirt cheaper at 1150 costs. And for people who don't own Warner Brothers Discovery already, I would say sell the $15 puts for two bucks or more. I think they're going for like 220 at the moment. You know, always ask for the ask. So see what the high price was for the day, then work your way backwards a nickel at a time every 10 to 20 minutes till, till it gets executed. Have a bunch of options in here. This is the one that I talked about there. Uh, back on July 25th. And I would say if you don't own Warner Brothers Discovery, this is another one of those stocks. And I've said it now about 10 different companies, at least this year. If you're not buying this stock down here, then you don't actually believe in buy low. You don't believe it. So don't ever tell me that you believe in buy low if you're not buying Warner Brothers Discovery here. You should be buying Warner Brothers Discovery here and selling puts. I'm going to take a, take a look at the two other stocks though. So Palantir, uh, got hammered today, and that's going to be short-lived. So this is a redo opportunity for you on Palantir. It's getting beat up because they took a write-off based on all those SPACs that they own, right? So that when these companies were going public and contracting with Palantir, Palantir took equity positions. Most of those companies are going to end up doing pretty well in the long run. So once again, I tell you, if you want something that's a little bit like Berkshire, a little bit like Markle, based on the new technologies, right? A, a company that owns parts of other companies. Palantir is the place to do it. They've made a lot of good investments. They haven't paid off yet. You're getting them dirt cheap. And by the way, this company has, what was it? Three or 400 million of free cash flow already. I'd have to double check. Their operating uh, results were, were fine. They just got beat up because of the SPAC. That, that might actually be a one day thing. So you can sell puts on this stock. And I would take a look at the October $9 because I think you can get a buck for them again. So these puts that we talked about a couple weeks ago, they came back to you. October 9 is almost. So if you can't get a buck, you could even go out to the Novembers. That's probably what I'll, I'm going to update these to. So go after the November 9s or the November 10s, depending on whether or not you have a position already. If you don't have a position, I strongly encourage you to take a starter and sell a put. Intel is the other one that I'm going to put into the article today. Intel is right in our buy zone. And I'm going to pull this out so you see where the supports are coming from. Right about there. So when I do these buy zones, I'm basing them on the time frame that I think that is relevant. And I think that the time frame that's relevant is the area above the consolidation that occurred in 2014, 15, 16. Now, there's a good possibility that that wasn't going to be right, that it could have stayed up here. But there are so many people that hate on Intel because of their perceptions of the company's mergers and acquisitions that I think that we're getting a little bit more sell-off than it deserves. And it did, in fact, end up in the area where I thought it would get to. I remember everybody told me I was nuts when I was up here, and now it's down here. These quant levels, based on where the selling and buying pressures are, from the big institutional investors for the most part, are remarkably effective. So if I'm right, it's probably going to stop going down very soon. Now, could it fall into this area here? It could, but that would be so short term based on retail selling that you'd see the institutions buy it back up. So your job as an investor is try to buy it in the area where you think it'll end up getting the institutional support, which is basically right now. So in South Korea, there is a bit of a chip uh, semiconductor chip inventory glut, weirdly. So we went from short on uh, inventory and semiconductors to doing pretty good. That's why the car companies are all pretty optimistic about their forecast for next year. 
And as Intel brings more manufacturing online and potentially there's less business done with Chinese companies, I think that's a pretty sure thing. Intel now starts to run this type of business that Taiwan Semiconductor ran for a long time, manufacturing other companies' chips and designs, and just taking cuts of all of that. So is Intel at the bottom bottom? It's pretty darn close. Doesn't get much lower than that on the RSI. If we take a look at the monthly RSI, which is a super long term, it's basically as low as it ever goes. So this is about as sold off as Intel gets. So what I'd like you to do is A, make sure you have a starter position in Intel. It pays a dividend. So there's not a lot of reason not to own some. I know some of you don't like to buy the growth stocks right away. I get it. You like the dividends. So I have you a sell puts so you get some dip. You now you get create your own dividend basically. This is pretty darn close. So I really like, I showed them in here too, I believe. The 3750 November puts are pretty interesting if you don't own the stock. If you do own the stock, I'd say go out to the 35s in December, collect around 250. That would give you a net cost of 3250. Could it get down there? It certainly could. If there's a Armageddon zombie apocalypse, it could get down into the 20s for a hot minute, but it won't stay. Again, if you don't own the stock, I would go to the 3750s in November, take a little less money, a little higher net cost because this is more likely to get put to you. So there's a couple different ways you can do this. You understand where I'm going? If you have the stock, sell the lower strike price further out, get that premium. If you don't have the stock, take a teeny tiny starter, then sell this. because It'll get you a net cost down at 34. And today it's trading at 35.40. So you can do, do it either way. Uh, if you want to get your position by selling puts, you want to do it by buying, you want to combine it. There's no perfect answer. It really depends a lot on you. So between Intel and Palantir and Warner Brothers Discovery, if you're not getting into positions on these right now and over the rest of the month, right, if you want to be greedy and try to get a couple extra quarters, I get it. You can't say that you believe in buying low if you're not looking at these right now. They're all oversold. They're all undervalued. That's, that's, that's double the enjoyment, right? I mean, you want both undervalued and, and, and oversold. And that's what you're getting right now on all three of these stocks. The upside for Intel is probably to triple. You could collect dividends along the way. The upside for Palantir is stratospheric. And the upside for Warner Brothers Discovery is to get to be at least as big as Netflix. So, you know, you've got a huge upside on all three of these. You can buy them dirt cheap, sell puts, collect big fat premiums because of the volatility, and away you go. Over on the ETF side, this VanEck Digital Transformation, I put in a couple links here. The adoption story that I've been telling you for months is real. It's starting to hit the rest of the press. You know, once again, you know, the stuff I read, you know, I'm going to be six months to a couple of years ahead usually. So the institutions and the family offices have started, just started to buy digital assets, mainly Bitcoin, a little bit of Ethereum and NFT here and there. But just literally be bites. Why? Because the rules aren't completely set yet. But we saw the deal from BlackRock last week with Coinbase. If that doesn't hit you in the head like a two by four, I don't know what will. BlackRock is the big deal in institutional investing in the world. The world. And they contracted with Coinbase to bring digital assets to their clients. And I think that BlackRock might buy Coinbase at some point, but they can't until the rules are set. Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank, is talking about the adoption story. What if they all just put a half percent of their money into digital assets? Price of Bitcoin is way into the six figures, way into the six figures. Might go over a million. Dr. Sean Steinsmith, who I interviewed around New Year's, is talking about the adoption story over on Forbes. I have the, I'll have the link in here for you to go and read. Here's your top 10 holdings. What do you notice? Marathon Digital, something that we are into. Coinbase, we never got into Coinbase because I didn't know what to do about it. Now I do. And then Block, which is Square. So we have put sold on this one. Really like Riot Blockchain. Silvergate Capital is uh, some very interesting tech in the space. It's uh, enabling other companies to, to use crypto assets. And again, this all has to do with not just Bitcoin being a store of value, but probably Ethereum being the backbone for digital contracting of real assets. Not digital assets, real assets like real estate, timeshares of all sorts, memberships of all sorts. It's all coming. It's coming faster than you think. The reason the rules process is uh, strung out is because politicians have to give their rich donors time 
to get in before you with information that you're not getting on the public side. I guarantee you there's lying, cheating, and stealing and scheming going on right now for the super wealthy to buy these assets before the prices go way up. I promise you that's true. Buy Bitcoin in a Coinbase account, right? If BlackRock trusts them, you can trust them. The link to Coinbase I have right at Fundamental Trends, and it's on margin of safety somewhere. But over on Fundamental Trends, I have the link right here on the bottom, way on the bottom, right? Click that and put $100 in there and buy some Bitcoin and you get $10. Yeah, we both get $10. I don't really care too much about that, but I like to see the traffic because then I can kind of track if my message is getting out there. So buy some Bitcoin through Coinbase. It's the one that BlackRock trusts. Told you on the front end, Coinbase would probably be the leader because they look like the safest. BlackRock picked them. They're not screwing around. And then these are the companies that are going to benefit from the ecosystem of crypto assets, NFTs, Bitcoin trading. These are the companies behind the technology. And you know, it's got some miners in here too. Yeah, somebody talks about buying through PayPal. Buying the assets at one place is not equivalent to always buying the assets at another place. Sometimes you're just getting a promise on the assets. And while I would trust the promise through PayPal, the way you know whether or not you truly own the asset and rather than just an IOU, is if you try to transfer those assets to <clears throat> an outside purse. So understand how a crypto purse works or wallet. And if you can't move your Bitcoin from platform to platform, then you don't really own it. And I'm pretty sure that's how it works over at PayPal. They just give you cash. You can cash out, but you can't move it. Coinbase, you own it because you can put it into a Coinbase wallet. You can take it out of the Coinbase wallet and send it over to any other wallet you want. Somebody says that they can transfer their uh, coins over to America's card room. <laughs> yeah, I use Bovada, but okay. <laughs> Anything else? I really want you in these three companies. If you don't already have them, consider this a buy notice. I'll put out a buy alert too. And DAP, you know, I'm going to put out a buy alert on DAP as well. I'll look for a day when it's down a little bit. I hope I get one. What's the play on DAP? You own this basket of companies. That's the play. Play is if Bitcoin's going to 100,000 or higher. That's the play. And then all of these are going to go up because of the PE multiple even more. This ETF could be a five or 10 bagger. An ETF. I mean, it'll end up looking like an arc chart possibly, which means you got to sell it when it gets really high. Can't say it's going up forever. So these are the puts that I'm selling on DAP. $7 December puts for a buck or more, but you need to also own at least a small position per this article from the other day, right? Own at least 4% if you're a senior. Oh, well, here we go. I think you get up to 6% pretty quick. I think you get 6% now. And in fact, I might even, for growth investors, I might even change that to eight. Or if you're really aggressive, I guess you could go to 12. Just understand this is a highly volatile asset. So I try not to go real big in the highly volatile assets. But four to 6%, I think you pretty much can get there right now. How do I weight crypto versus DAP? This is for your brokerage account. What do you own it in place of? You don't own cryptocurrency in place of your brokerage assets. You buy Bitcoin with part of your bank savings because your bank savings, you're really hoping to never spend it, which means it's a super long-term asset except for emergencies. So I've told people take about 10% of your bank savings. So if you have a hundred grand in the bank, put 10,000 in the Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I do it at two to one. I buy twice as much Bitcoin as I do Ethereum. Because Ethereum is still a bit more speculative. It could be unseated by, by a competitive uh, blockchain. Ethereum is really far ahead, though. It would take a monumental effort to unseat Ethereum, but it's not impossible. So if you're sitting on 50 grand or 150 grand or 250 grand in the bank, which I know a lot of people who follow me are, take 10% of that and scale into Bitcoin and Ethereum. And back when the prices were higher, I was telling you to take a longer period to do it. Well, now that the prices are lower, do it fast. Do it between now and I'd say by the end of the year. So if you have 100 grand in the bank and you want to put 10,000 into Bitcoin and Ethereum, do it over the next five months. Equal parts, pick a day. Coinbase lets you do that. Pretty easy. Coinbase has a thing where you can make recurring contributions, which is what I use. I don't even know what day of the month it is anymore. But on a certain day of the month, I have a certain amount of money going to Bitcoin and then half as much going to Ethereum every month. All right, folks, let's call it a day. Um, expect choppiness. Expect a lot of do-overs. If you are newer to the, one of the services, a lot of the things that we've been buying this year, you're going to get another chance to buy. Selling puts is your best friend. So, you know, I think that uh, 
the next four or five months, you ought to be really looking to get fully invested by December. And again, I'm specifically saying by the end of the second week of December. I think the new bull market starts on December 15th, unless we're already in it. But I think between now and the December Fed meeting, right, which is the 13th and 14th, I think the market's choppy. I think the Fed pivot comes sometime between October and December. It may not be a, it's not going to be a Fed pivot, actually. I think that the Fed pause on interest rates comes between October and December. That's my guess. Could push all the way out to January, maybe, or February. But uh, we're getting really close to a rip-roaring bull market on that decarbonization and fourth industrial revolution sides. And like I said the other day, I think biotech is coming. There's going to be a lot of consolidation, and a lot of those companies are going to come out screaming. So keep an eye on it. All right. I will uh, have a very large stocks of the week, probably late tonight. Um, I, I, I literally have a mountain of notes and I want to put the most important stuff in there for you. All right, take care.